Good morning, everybody. Really good to see you here this morning after the dinner last night. Um, so, welcome to um, the second day of the annual conference of the British Association of Applied Linguistics. Um, welcome to those of you who are joining online as well. I believe we've had about 15 people for every slot, so we're getting an audience, um, hopefully internationally, as well as here um, in York today. And I, I should actually recognise the um, executive committee for funding this. This is something that we'd wanted to do to open up the conference. And you'll know that some of our other sessions are being streamed live as well. Um, uh, so just as people um, get their seats, just another reminder from yesterday, just so we don't have any al unexpected alarms, um, when we do finish this talk um, this morning, if you can either leave from the back of the room or the sort of just be beneath the stairs, um, please do not use the fire exits, it will set off the alarms. Anyway, now that everybody is sat down, um, I am pleased to introduce this morning our Pitt Corder Lecture. So for those of you who are new to the community and not familiar with Pitt Corder, Pitt Corder what, um, is um, the founding chair of the British Association of Applied Linguistics. And he was born here in York. So if you're staying for the weekend or longer, um, you may want to take a trip um, into Bootham um, to find um, the plaque that um, York St John's students um, campaigned to get put in place. So, um, <clears throat> and so what is Pitt Corder known for? So Pitt Corder is known for error analysis and his influence on work in second language acquisition theory. Um, further to that, he also worked for the British Council, um, where he was engaged in the development of curriculum and teaching materials. So um, reflecting that, our Pitt Corder lecture traditionally celebrates work on the theme of language, teaching and learning. Um, so in recognition of this and the increasing um, interest uh, among the community, even before the pandemic, but, but among everybody now, we've experienced online teaching. Um, what we would like to do today is to, um, to, uh, to recognise the work on this theme within the community through a lecture from um, Professor Glenn Stockwell. Um, I should say there's another reason for us inviting Glenn. Um, one of our reasons is that we're trying to open up the community. We recognise that every year there, there's a strong representation of colleagues from Japan. Um, and so Glenn is here to represent um, those colleagues as well, that aspect of the community. Um, so um, I'll just say a few words then about Glenn. Um, so um, if you don't know Glenn, Glenn is a professor of applied linguistics at the Graduate School of International Culture and Communication Studies at Waseda. Um, he works within the field of applied linguistics um, and I'm sure if you joined the, the book prize yesterday you'll be aware that um, his interests lie in computer assisted language learning um, and particularly mobile assisted language learning. Um, he's co-author of a couple of other books in addition to the, the one that we recently celebrated in the book prize. Um, so the highly cited, um, di uh, sorry, uh, Call Dimensions, um, which he, he worked on with Professor Mike Levi. Um, and then also his sole authored book, Computer Assisted Language Learning, Diversity in Research and Practice. Um, Further to that, he's an active uh, member of the computer assisted language learning community, member of a number of the associations and editor of a number of journals. Um, sorry. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome um, Glenn Stockwell to join us for the Pitt Corder Lecture. Okay, um, first of all I'd like to um, say thank you very much to the, both the local organising committee and to the executive committee of BAAL for inviting me uh, to speak here. I was uh, delighted, terrified, um, honoured to have been asked um, and in particular the Pitt Corder Lecture is a, is a historical lecture that uh, celebrates the work of an outstanding applied linguist and to be asked to, to give the Pitt 
called a lecture really was a, a humbling experience. So I will do my best to uh, uh, speak on a theme that, that will uh, honour the tradition of uh, talking about applied linguistics. Um, my field is, as you've already heard uh, from Zoe's very kind introduction, uh, technology in language teaching and learning. Of course, technology in language teaching and learning is based on a solid foundation of uh, applied linguistics. It's not a separate field, it's a part of and integrated fully with applied linguistics. Um, it is applied linguistics, um, but it looks at uh, several ways in which technology can be used as a tool in facilitating or supporting the language teaching and learning process. So this can be pedagogically, it can be socio-culturally, it can be uh, depending on, on our literacies. There, there are many different aspects of, apart from just the technology itself that we need to be taking into consideration when we think about the use of technology in our language teaching and learning contexts. Now, recently we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought technology in education generally, not just language education, but in education generally, more into the, the foreground. It's raised a lot of awareness about the strong and weak points of using technology in language education. Now, I was in Iceland last week for the Eurocall conference, and I selected this next picture, which you've already had a, a sneak preview of, um, based on that, which is this. And it kind of reminded me of the way that many teachers felt at the beginning of the pandemic. In front of us was this enormous force of nature that we had nothing that we could do to stop it. And yet we had to face up to it alone. I mean, there was support from our institutions, but we know that in many cases the institutions were not able to keep up with the support that we needed. So I'll be discussing this in a little bit more depth in a moment, but I think many of us in the beginning stages of the pandemic, when we had to switch to online only teaching environments, usually sitting at home by ourselves during the lockdown periods in, in many of the regions uh, around the world. I mean, we had it in Japan, I know that it was across Australia and it was across much of Europe. And it was a daunting experience for many. Okay, so as we know, technology suddenly became the primary medium of teaching. Now, some teachers were already experienced with uh, using technology, but even those that did have experience struggled because it was a different type of using technology. It was the entire teaching environment was moved online. And we had little time, and for most people, little experience in adapting. Now, those who were teaching in distance education settings, and I've talked to Carol about this just uh, the other day, were in a better position because they've been doing this for quite some time. But at the same time, if you look at how much time it took in that context to prepare each module to be taught online, compared with a very, very short amount of time that most teachers found themselves having to be able to teach effectively online. And I have a feeling that the word effectively was something that came up later. First of all, it was to survive teaching online is what most of us felt. I think probably most of you have heard of the term emergency remote teaching. Now, emergency because it really was an emergency. We just suddenly had to do it. I mean, it was remote because we were distant in most cases. But emergency remote teaching, the term itself uh, invokes a, a, a temporary nature. However, I think probably most of us felt that this would be finished within six months and we'd be all back to regular classes in a shorter period of time. But it went on a lot longer than most of us anticipated. Now, there were some problems which came along with this, which I'll come back to in a moment. But this emergency remote teaching was, and I, I really like this, this uh, quote from Hodges et al, which says that the, the faculty might feel like instructional MacGyvers, having to improvise quick solutions in less than ideal circumstances. 
And if I asked you to raise your hand, did you feel this way? I'm pretty sure pretty much everybody's going to put their hands up. I can put both hands up and both feet if I could. And I've been using technology for years. I started in the field of call in 1995. So, I mean, it's a long time. Okay, so uh, I really started in it slightly before that, but I started as a serious researcher in the field in 1995. And I felt nervous about this. So how are teachers and those teachers who have had little or no experience with technology going to feel? So we were teaching in crisis. And what do we do in this circumstance? Most of us will try to go back to what feels familiar to us. So we try to teach the way that we did face to face. So we're trying to replicate our teaching environments that we did face to face through the tools that were available. Now the tools became available in dribs and drabs for many. Um, my own uh, institution, Wasset University, um, obviously needed to subscribe to Zoom suddenly on a very large scale. Uh, they had just set up a new Moodle which was to be implemented from that year. They had their own system for years before that. And on the first day of classes, what happened? Everything crashed. The load was much more than they anticipated. It wasn't able to keep up. So the first day of classes ended up being a kind of practice day, which didn't eventuate for most, and the first day started the next day. Now, what this really showed us was that the, the institutions were not able to provide adequate teacher and learner support, and that includes the technical support or even the technical technological resources, and it showed the lack of organizational readiness. We were provided with tools that we weren't familiar with their affordances, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this term, but I'll come back to this in a moment because I think it's a, an interesting term which we use a lot in the field of technology in language teaching and learning. And many institutions introduce these technologies kind of with this expectation that, well, they'll work it out. There wasn't enough of a, an infrastructure in place to provide the mass training that was required for teachers and learners to successfully implement technology in their environments. They did their best. I have to say, it's not like that the institutions were kind of like, okay, we're not worried, worried about this, we're going to leave you to your own devices. It wasn't the case. It was just too much to handle in a short period of time. Okay, I'm going to come back to the idea of affordances in a moment. But I think probably a lot of us felt that we needed to go through a period of professional development during the pandemic. It was a different teaching world. It was so very different from what many of us had done beforehand. Of course there were similarities. I mean, we're still teaching what we were teaching. But the technology made this happen in a way that was so completely different that there were some things that we really just had to abandon or adapt quite dramatically. Uh, from my experience, I remember doing group work with my students using Zoom. And I'm sure that probably many of you would have experienced that disaster as well. I said, OK, we'll put you into great breakout sessions. Everybody, here's the topic. And the students would disappear, and I would be alone for a moment in the main room before I went into each room. So I'd go into room one, and you'd see the students chatting away quite happily. I go into room two and all the cameras were off and it was dead silent. <laughs> and then you'd hear a comment from one of the students going, yeah, but, we like, oh. <laughs> cameras suddenly came on, oh, hello. <laughs> and, and obviously they thought there's a, a break time, not a break out time. So when we have our face-to-face -face classes, I'm sure probably many of you do this as well. When I have my group work, I do a lot of group work in, in my classes. And I'm talking to this group, and I'm listening to them. But I'm actually listening to this group. So you can't really do that. That was one of the, the limiting points with the technology that I really felt quite frustrated about. I mean, there are tools which can make this possible to a certain degree. But it was different. We really needed to adjust to this. So we went through, as I mentioned here, a large period of um, professional development. There was such a variation between institutions. Some institutions were better at this than others. And those that couldn't find the support that they needed went to online communities. So um, this study by um, Ito, Yurika Ito, is one of my um, ex-PhD students. And she explored 
uh, online communities, she actually started the research before the pandemic. And then she saw this enormous shift that took place in the discourse that was seen through these online communities where people were not calling for help, they were screaming for help. It's like, what do I do? Because they didn't feel that they were being supported by their institutions. Okay? Now, what did we find through the pandemic? We found that there, were really, there was really a polarization in one sense. On the one side, we had the acceptors, and the other side, we had the rejectors. Now, we can say that some people really, as I've written here, they embraced the new technologies. I mean, struggle, of course, but they embraced and they came up with some really interesting, unique, thoughtful methods of teaching. Others felt that their existing resistance, so there were teachers who were already resisting technology. When this happened, they felt that their resistance was justified. See, this is why we don't use technology, because we can't do this and we can't do this. And they really felt kind of like um, the pandemic proved that their concerns about technology were correct. And others failed to adjust and they just left. There are many people who quit the profession being unable to adjust to these massive changes without seeing a way out. I'm sure most of us would never have dreamed that it would go on as long as it did. Now I mentioned the ERT, Emergency Remote Teaching, a moment ago. We'll see some people who really did change their teaching over time and they did develop professionally. But there are others who remained in emergency mode all the way through to the end, trying to just join one class to the next. And we didn't see any development in teaching over time. What this has left for many is, and you'll see that I've used the term aftermath of the pandemic, it's left strongly negative impressions about technology in both the teachers and the learners. Of course it's not everybody, it's a proportion. But we see some teachers and learners who have come out of this feeling technology is not useful to my teaching or to my learning. And that's something that is a concern if we think about the long term. Technologies are here. Are we going to be acceptors or rejectors of technology? I would say rejecting is probably a brave choice. If that's your choice, then of course no one can criticize that. But I think that we're going to see more and more over time that we are going to have to embrace technology as a part of our teaching environment. It doesn't mean it is the teaching environment. It will always be a part of the teaching environment. I'm going to come back to the term of affordances. So I've, I've uh, mentioned this a couple of times before. <clears throat> You're probably going to be very surprised that I'm going to show you this on the screen. Okay. okay. This is probably what many of you want to do with technology. But I'll ask the question, when you see this, what do you think of? Okay, from functionality, what do you think of when you see this? Okay, many of you probably just think of the word. Okay, maybe you think hammer, okay, or whatever language that may come to mind, first of all, when you see this. Okay. Now, it has its own physical characteristics. Okay. It has a handle, it has a metal bit at the end, and it can be used for many different things, including putting nails into wood, a bruise on my thumb. Okay. We can use it for lots of things, but this will depend very much on who we are. Now, why I'm giving you this example is we can substitute this hammer with a mobile phone, with a computer, with a, an online system, with Zoom. It has its own physical, physical characteristics. It has its own functions. But how we use this will depend very much on other factors, like my skills. Okay? A master carpenter with this hammer may be able to build a house. Okay? The same thing with technology. If I have the skills, I have a greater ability to do more with the same technology. 
So in many cases, we keep our eyes on the technology without thinking about that the technology is the tool through which we accomplish things. It depends on our experience, and this can be positive or negative. Okay? After having very many black thumbs, I look at this with some fear. Okay? And I'm sure the same thing happens with some teachers who are using technology for the second or third time. They think, oh, I had a bad experience last time. Okay? But we can only replace our bad experiences with good experiences through our continuing to push forward. And the other one that I think is extremely important is our imagination. Okay? I've seen some wonderful work done, published work done by people who were not familiar with technology before the pandemic, but they lacked experience. I don't know if you can see this. They lacked their experience, and perhaps they lacked the skills, but they equipped themselves with the skills, because, the skills they needed because of their imagination. So we can push through, okay? but we need to keep Probably, I think, the most important thing is our imagination. What is it that we can do with the technology? I'm going to show you a, 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 an example of the trends. It's, it's not an exhaustive list. It's fairly representative. But um, we can see where have we come over the last uh, several decades. So you can see I'm moving from 1990s, actually from before that, the 1980s, through to uh, 2000s, 2010s, 2020s. Okay, you can see some familiar things, the drill-based activities. Uh, the very early technologies that we used were very much uh, behaviorist in, in nature, where we had kind of uh, uh, multiple choice with vocabulary or grammar. Went through web-based with the, the dawn of the internet. We had CMC, which is computer-mediated communication, like email or chat and other functions. We had uh, LMSs, Learning Management System, um, sometimes called VLE, Virtual Learning Environment. Um, Moodle was very, very popular towards the, uh, really through the early 2000s. Um, we saw Moves, which are multi-user virtual environments. Okay, I don't know if some of you have heard of uh, Second Life, where you can immerse yourself in the environment with an avatar. Mobile learning um, was probably earlier than many people uh, expected. It was around before smartphones. People were using their GSM phones for mobile learning. Me too. I was actually teaching uh, with mobile devices in the mid-2000s. Educational gaming, MOOCs, social networking, iCall. iCall is intelligent computer-assisted language learning. This is, yes, AI. And more recently, we're seeing machine translation and the one that seems to be on everybody's uh, lips at the moment, which is generative AI. So we have seen these shifts over time. Just because a new one appears, it doesn't mean that the old ones disappear. These are obviously occurring uh, concurrently. We see new ones come into the foreground and others into the background, but they're all coexisting. We still have drill type activities. We still have uh, multi-user virtual environments. Obviously, we still have mobile learning. Okay? But we're seeing that there is a, a shift in focus over time. And what makes this possible is the techni technical developments. Okay? The technology has come a long way. If we look at AI, for example, this is far from a new field. It's been around for a long time. But it is different now from what it was in the past. And I'll revisit this later on in the presentation. With this, we have our changing affordances. So the affordances of these technologies are different. We can do different things with them. But we still need those other elements that I mentioned before. We need our skills. We need to develop our experience. And we need to keep our imagination. Okay. Now, I'm going to revisit these two a little bit later on in the presentation, because I feel that this is somewhere uh, it's a point that a lot of people are quite concerned about uh, at the moment. Um, and the concerns, I think, are quite valid in some ways. And in other ways, I think probably we need to take a step back and view things calmly. Okay? But I'll talk about that in a moment. So let's think about the use of technology in language teaching and, and learning. Okay? So we have this model already. We know we have practice and we have research. 
and one should inform the other. I mean, there's so many books, so many papers that talk about research and practice. And there's so much criticism about the lack of interaction between the two, and as well as how much it, there is an interaction between the two. Okay? <clears throat> when we add to this technology, we have another element where technology can affect practice. Practice can affect how we use or the technologies that we choose. The same thing between technology and research. Technology can be the focus of research, but can also be the medium through which research is conducted. It can be what we are looking at, or we can be looking through the technology to examine our uh, area that we're considering. Behind this, we have theory. Okay, so theory is always there. Now, theory is going to change the way that we see things. Okay, so if I have in mind this theory, it's going to slightly change the way we see an environment. If I'm coming in from an interactionist uh, theory, it's going to be different from someone who's coming in from a socio-cultural theory, slightly. But sometimes we get too close to this that we forget that the theories that we carry in our mind are altering the way that we consider the environment. Now, in call, theory is quite naturally, predominantly from SLA or education. Of course it is. We're language learning. Okay? However, we can't ignore the technology there as well. Now, I'm sure many of you would remember the late Stephen Bax, who talked about normalization of technology. Technology will reach a point where we don't need to think about it anymore. But just because we don't notice it doesn't mean it isn't making a difference. It's changing things. Okay? So we need to think about what is the impact of the technology on what we're doing. We also need to remember that all of this happens in a context. How I teach with technology in Japan, for example, is naturally going to be different slightly from what I teach in say, the UK. A simple example, what is the most commonly used messaging app in the UK? What is it? I'm not sure. You have to tell me. What's that? Okay. In Japan, nobody uses it. It's Line. Okay. This is a, a small point, but it's a large point. If I try to say to my students, okay, let's use WhatsApp, they'll say, what's that? <laughs> okay. Quite naturally. Okay. So we have these small points that we need to consider that the context will make a difference. Now, what about other theories? I've just mentioned technology is going to make a difference. So what do we have? This is a very brief overview from, from uh, my uh, mobile learning book, which is uh, published by Cambridge University Press, where I've looked at some of the theories that relate to not the language learning process itself, but other elements more related to technology. I'm not going to go through this. Um, there's a lot, as you can see, but they're broken down into we can have the design, we can have our attitudes towards technology, I mean the theories and models. Digital literacies, we're going to have a presentation later on uh, in the day today about digital literacy, which I'm very much looking forward to. Okay? The impact of technology on our thinking processes is also part of this. So we can see that technology is making a difference above and beyond just being the tool that we use to teach our class or that something that we research. I'll move on to AI because as I've just mentioned, it's obviously one of the, uh, the topics of the day in many ways. And here you can see uh, uh, a title of a research paper. So it's by Adams, Morrison and Reddy. And as you can see, it's conversation with the computer as a technique of language instruction, 1968. Okay. So, is ChatGPT new? Yes. Is it going to change things? Yes. Have we ever encountered this before? Yes. In a different shape or form. So we need to look back sometimes at what's been done before. And I see a lot of reinventing of the wheel. And every time we have one of these larger technologies, these big shifts 
in technologies appearing, we have typically mass panic. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to be replaced by the technology. Well, it's a very controversial statement, but it was uh, made in 1984. It said that any teacher that can be replaced by technology should be. <laughs> in other words, we are bringing far more to the table than technology. Yes, technology has some amazing aspects to it. There are some really mind-boggling things that are being done with the technology. But there is always going to be, in my view, the need for the human element. Okay? Now, our roles as teachers will shift. They are shifting. They have been shifting. There have been minor shifts over time. Sometimes they're bigger, sometimes they're smaller. And we have been adapting to these and our practices have changed over time. This is another shift. Okay? We don't know yet exactly to what extent, but it's a shift that we will get used to, adapt to, and then we will be able to uh, make the most of these tools later on. I don't know if many of you are familiar with the Hype Cycles by Gartner. Okay, Gartner is an organization, not a person, by the way, um, if, uh, if you weren't uh, familiar with them. Now, what they argue is that when a new technology appears, we have our technology trigger. And I really love the terminology that's used here. We have our technology trigger, and you can see this jump up here all the way through to our peak of inflated expectations. Okay. Just think for a moment. What are we thinking about chat GPT and other machine translation tools at the moment? Do we have inflated expectations? Okay. Look at the media, yes. Okay. This is usually followed by the trough of disillusionment. Okay. Again, I love these expressions. They, they, they really sum it up beautifully. I can give you an example of something that happened not so long back. I mean, I guess it is quite a while back now. I'm getting old. I'm just forgetting that. And uh, that is we had iPads. Remember when iPads were first started to be used in our uh, educational context? And people said, oh, our teaching is going to be changed forever. The iPad's going to do this and it's going to do that. And we're really up the top of this peak of inflated expectations. And it wasn't that long before people started saying, oh, no, iPad's not that good. So we drop down to our trough of disillusionment. We say, well, we can't do anything and everything with this new technique, this new technology, sorry. So I'll go back a moment. Um, Stephen Bax, normalization. Most people in that 2003 paper, they talk about the normalization that he mentioned in that paper. But actually, that was a wonderful paper because the second half to me was more interesting. In the second half of the paper, he talked about the fact that we have this kind of inbuilt idea that when a new technology comes out, it's going to solve all of the problems of what came before it. And we often discard the old technologies for the new one because we are filled with this hope of what it can accomplish. But usually what happens is the trough of disillusionment. It can't do it. Okay? So we need to be thinking about what can we do with these tools. And this is when we start to work our way up the slope of enlightenment. Again, lovely expression. We've gone past the hype. We've gone past the disillusionment. This is the tool. Okay. Now, what can we do with this? And over time, we start to build up to what they term the plateau of productivity, where we use the tools when it is appropriate. And we don't use it when it's not appropriate. Now, with our new technologies that we're seeing, with generative AI, machine translation, it's going to mean some paradigm shifts, which I'll come back to in a moment. But we're still going to follow this basic path. Okay? In a few years' time, I think probably, if you think back to this, you'll say, yeah, actually, it did happen. And I think you'll find that it will. Okay? I don't have a crystal ball, but I've seen it happen a lot of times before. So I think you'll find we're going to go through this. This is where we are with ChatGPT at the moment, I feel. 
Okay, we're on the way up. We're still seeing, oh, wow, this is wonderful, this is great, this is terrifying, and our inflated expectations are, are coming up. Okay. Now, what we're doing really here, sorry, is we are technology focused. And when a new technology comes out, typically this is what happens. We focus on the technology. We think about what the possibilities are. Now, usually, this is done with very little empirical evidence. We're discussing the possibilities. Now, this is important. This is something we need to do. We need this stage. But we shouldn't stop at this stage. This is the starting point that we can use where we can start to think about the focus on good practice. Technology itself is not good practice. Okay? It's what we do with the technology that brings about good practice. Let's just take a moment to look at AI and machine translation, or MT tools as they're commonly used. Now, as we know, there's been an explosion of AI translation tools in recent years. Um, Google Translate, uh, DeepL, uh, Bing Microsoft Translator, Amazon Translate. Probably most of you don't even know Amazon Translate exists. I didn't know until I started looking for it. But, oh, wow, they translate too. Okay. These are very clever tools. You probably noticed a very big change in Google Translate from a few years ago. Um, it shifted its model to um, a model that I'll mention in a moment that is in line with uh, DeepL. Um, has anybody used DeepL here before? It's pretty good. Okay. But I'm sure in using it, you've also seen some limitations. Okay. Or Google Translate, or being Microsoft Translator. We can say that these tools create both opportunities and challenges. The problem is that often we tend to set our eyes on either the opportunities or the challenges when we need to be looking at both of them at the same time. Okay. So NMT is a neural machine translation, and this is what is used by DeepL, Amazon, Bing Translator, and, as I mentioned, post 2016, Google Translate. They used a different model beforehand. Okay, so um, using deep neural networks means that it, the, the deeper the network, I mean, you get better translation. I mean, they can be trained, um, but it's a different type of training process which happens with the large language models. Now, large language models, that's, this is the technology that is behind ChatGPT. Okay, so at the moment, we are in the, the GPT 4.0 phase. GPT has been around for quite some time. Okay? It's not all that new. It's been around maybe six or seven years okay? in different shapes or forms. We've gone from GPT 1, 2, 3, 3.5, 4. 3.5, oh, sorry, 4.5 is, is under development. It generates, as you've seen, I'm, I'm sure most of you have tried it at some point, very human like responses to user prompts. The training process of the large language model is the key. There is an enormous training process that goes on. It's done, first of all, by a computer training the computer. It, uh, it's a, like a probability machine in many ways, where it talks about the, where it considers the possible next terms that come along in language, linguistically, what could be next. And then it's tested with large numbers of human users who then evaluate these. And that's how we train GPT. I'm sure we've also come across this danger of hallucination in responses. Now, hallucination, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the term. I, I really like this term, actually. It's when chat GPT or other GPT tools provide us with information and it looks so good, but it's so wrong. <clears throat> you read through it, wow, that's fantastic. I remember I was uh, running a study in my uh, classes, actually my, my uh, colleague and I were, were running uh, this uh, just recently, and as part of this I asked ChatGPT to provide a bio data for me. And I did this in class for the students. I said, oh look, I can put this in and here's a bio data of me. And it said, Professor Glenn Stockwell graduated with a PhD from the University of Auckland in 1994. I've never been to Auckland. I'm not that old. Okay. Um, it was wrong in pretty much everything, but it looked beautiful. So we can see we do have these problems. 
Okay, so hallucination is there. It's being raised more and more. Actually, if you try it one more time now, it says, I'm sorry, I don't have enough information if this person wasn't famous before 2021 or something. And I'm, well, it was telling me about 1994. It was wrong, but it was, I was existing then. So obviously, they put something in which has stopped this from, from uh, pr producing these types of responses. Anyway, I'll push on. Okay. So <clears throat> generative AI and language learning has attracted enormous attention from teachers, policymakers, and I think the biggest one is the media. The media is hyping this in many ways. This hyping, I think, is in some ways clouding our view about what we can and cannot do with generative AI tools. Okay. We see, look, we've done this, we've done this. And I'll say, first of all, it's brilliant. This chat GPT and the GPT technologies are brilliant. But they are tools for which we can learn how to use them. There are several potential uses. Okay. One of them is an ideas bag at the drafting stage. We can use it for proofreading, paraphrasing. I've done this a few times before. I put it into uh, ChatGPT and said, well, this is how I phrase it. Can you give me a, bit, a paraphrase? And it's come up with some pretty good paraphrases. Sometimes it shifts the meaning. Uh, sometimes I can see it's using certain kind of cliché terms that I wouldn't use. So I don't do it anymore. But I experimented for a while to see what it would do. And it can do some interesting things. But we can see clearly that there are very big repercussions for assessment practices. And this is perhaps one of the biggest points we need to be considering, is what happens with our assessment practices. And it also includes the lack of source attribution. Okay, so I don't know where the information that it's pulling out is coming from. And often it will attribute an imaginary source to something. Well, you wanted a source, here's one. Okay but it's not a real one. Okay. So if we think about the opportunities for machine translation, generative AI, I mean, here's just a very short sample of some of the things that I've seen. I mean, we were looking at uh, writing and vocabulary in, in a, a small study, a pilot study that we conducted earlier in the year, expanding learners' vocabulary. Okay. Now, this is machine translation. It's not generative AI. Uh, improving accuracy and fluency, relieving learner anxiety and also useful for post-writing assistance. Now, more specifically, if we look at um, generative AI, we can see we have these challenges as well. One of them is that they are undervalued and often prohibited by teachers. Okay? These tools are here. We can put our head in the sand, or we can block off and say, no, you can't use them. But at the same time, are we using them? So can we say, you can't use it, but I can. Okay. We need to be kind of a little bit um, uh, careful about the way that we restrict usage um, when we are using them ourselves. Yes, there are very valid worries about inaccuracies in translation. The fear of over-reliance on machine translation. And of course, cheating, which is one of the big points that comes up. There's also an enormous gap between learner and teacher perspectives. Um, I'll come back to this in a moment. Learners themselves, in many cases, are just simply worried about breaking the rules. It's not that they want to use the tools inappropriately. They just don't know what the rules are. And this is something that we need to be considering. As part of a, a pilot study that uh, we were running earlier in the year, um, my colleague, um, Yijin Wang, and I will be doing the second part of the study later in this year. One of the questions that we asked as part of the larger study is, are you allowed to use AI tools for learning English? And you can see the spread of responses here. But the one that I thought was particularly interesting was this one, the not sure. There's no policy being outlined for the students. They don't know if they're allowed to use it or not. What are the boundaries? Aren't we providing these for our students? And typically, we aren't. But if we look at what students want to do with them, okay, this is 87 learners 
studying English in Japan across a number of classes. They were first year students, they were enrolled in a, a pre-intermediate uh, course. We did a short training session with the, stu the, the students, first of all, to show them how to use machine translation, how to use ChatGPT, and then we gave students opportunities to have uh, group discussions and group hands-on experiences where they discussed what they did and discussed possible uses for them. Okay, this is uh, in a paper which is coming up uh, later, it's a chapter actually that's coming up uh, uh, in the near future. A couple of other interesting things that were mentioned. Do you think using AI tools for writing is ethical? Can you see more than half think yes? I mean there's a one third not sure and 15% no. Okay, so they're not viewing the tool itself as being unethical. But when you think about it, it's like saying, do you think asking your friend is unethical? Okay. Can you see there is a parallel here? It's not necessarily it's the tool or the opportunities, it's how you use them. And I thought this next part was really good. Do you want to learn how to use AI tools appropriately? A lot do. They really just want to know. Okay? And I underline the word appropriately here. Okay? So considering AI tools, and I'm, I'm coming to, to the end of my presentation now, but um, we need to be open with learners about the tools and let the learners see the strengths and weaknesses. So in class, I asked the students to write my profile. It came up with a, a wrong one. The students found this fascinating. So what they did after that was they were asking ChatGPT information about things they knew to see how accurate it was. And some comments that they came up with, I like the bottom one here, we can see through the magic of ChatGPT now. It's because they opened their eyes to it. Okay? They also said the tools are indeed convenient, but we should not trust them totally. By judging if the results are appropriate or not, we can improve our English. You can see they're trying to see how to link this with a pedagogy, how to use it for their language learning, not for cheating. So if we focus too much on the cheating and not on what we can do with it, sometimes we're throwing away the baby with the bathwater. We do need to provide clear guidelines of usage, with 40% not knowing how to do it. And really importantly, we need to understand the implications for assessment. The students are going to produce better work at the end. The final product will be better. They have ChatGPT, they have machine translation, they have ways of checking what the final product is. Therefore, we need to change our focus more, I believe, on the process. How are they using it? Can we use the process as a part of our assessment rather than just simply the final product? I don't, can't tell you now how to do it. This is discussion that we need to have. But this is really discussion we need. So, to conclude, we need to reconcile our teacher and learner views. So we need to be mindful of the gap between teacher and learner attitudes towards AI, which means opening our eyes and our ears. And you can see I'm using the open theme here quite a bit. Overly positive or overly negative views of technology from teachers can affect student usage. Teachers do have biases. We're sometimes not aware of it. If it's negative, we need to open our minds to new possibilities. And moving forwards, training. We need training. But this is one of the big problems. Our teachers need to train our learners, but who is going to train the teachers? And this is a big discussion that we need from here. Maybe we should be, those who are more experienced with using the technologies, maybe we can be opening our classes to those who are in need of assistance. Come in, have a look, have a look to see how I use it. But a lot of us tend to be quite defensive of our classes, we don't really want other people coming in. But maybe we need to do this. And I think perhaps the, the final point, and maybe the most important point, is we need a safe space for exploration and communication about these tools. So we open the dialogue between teachers, learners, administrators, and I could have thrown many, many other things, policy makers, so on, so on, into this. And I think this way we can move forward with technologies, regardless of what changes in the future. Thank you.
Thank you, Glenn, for a really, really interesting talk. I think you ticked a number of boxes there, so um, I guess providing a, a foundation or primer for those who, who are in the broader applied linguistics community, but also addressing the hype and hysteria around AI. It's really, really good to, to see some talks actually addressing that. Anyway, what I would like to do now then is to open up to questions. I'm so sure we've got a lot of questions in the audience. Um, do please remember, if you have got a question, um, we've got the roving mics, and if you could please let us know your, your name and where you're from. Anybody, any questions? Hello, I'm Chantal Hemi from Sophia University, Tokyo. Oh. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Oh, it you. helped me very much to sort out the things I'm thinking about in oh, terms of the use of technology in oh, my teaching you. and training. The first part of what I'm going to say is a quick comment about using technology. The second one is a very short question from me. Um, I found that during COVID, we made very, very good use of technology because we had to. Yeah. And one of the things we did was we did in-service training sessions mm -hmm. for the whole university, for example, for the use of um, high flex classes. And we conducted all our in-service training online yes. by Zoom. That worked really, really, really well mm -hmm. because we had a need to do that. Yes. And what I'm thinking is that uh, the Japanese government are looking into um, creating a super intelligent society with a kind of blended learning society yes. using technology and face-to-face -face activities. And I'm finding that to enable us to do that, um, the technology cannot be our master. Human beings have got to be um, the master. And I'm thinking that perhaps we need to think about what the benefit is for students and what the benefits are for, for teachers as well. And um, if we just uh, force people to use technology, I think we're still being the slave. And so my question is this, um, what kind of things have you come across in terms of research or your practical practice where you considered the benefits or the motiv raising the motivation of students and teachers and how has it turned out to be? Uh, just a comment, I am not an avatar. <laughs> um, thank you for the, for the comment and for the question. Um, there's been evidence for, for, for a very long time that forcing teachers to use technology isn't going to work. Uh, essentially, the technology will only be used for as long as it's forced to be used. There are some who will adopt or adapt the technologies beyond that, but many will just simply leave them by the wayside. Um, the in-service training that you were referring to, it, it happens quite broadly, but there are those who take advantage of that training and those who do not. And again, we can't force the teachers who don't want to engage in the training to do so. But I think probably the biggest point is um, awareness raising. We need to have these, well I mentioned about the dialogue, these open discussions about what the technology can and can't do and then allow teachers to make their own decisions about when and where or even if to use the technology. Um, <clears throat> Technology as a motivator is not very effective. Technology is a short-term motivator. We've got mountains of evidence of this. Motivation happens through technology if there is an appropriate instructional design. Okay, but it's not usually the technology which is causing the motivation. Motivated teachers and learners will use technology. But sustained usage is very dependent upon one, the motivation to try to use it, but two, it's also the, uh, the skills. So we talk about the skill and the will as being the, the point of autonomy, and that's really the same with using technology as a student or a teacher. Okay? Yes, we need to find a way to show what the benefits possibly will be. From there, we can take the next step to train. 
But for those people who have already closed their minds to using technology, it's going to be a bit of a challenge. So I'm not sure if I've answered your, your question completely, but it's, it's a complex issue that has a, a very broad implications beyond a single institution. I think we had another question. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think you Did you still? Yeah. It was your question. <laughs> okay, any other questions then? Um, so maybe we can just go up here. Thank you, Chantal. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Rose Mitchell from Southampton. Um, your excellent talk concentrated on the classroom and on teachers yeah. and students in an organized structure. But obviously, there's been a huge rise in individualized learning through apps and so on. Yes, yes. And indeed, um, I don't know if people have noticed, but West Virginia University in the USA has said that they can now close entirely their languages department mm -hmm. because they can support people who want to learn languages through remote learning and apps and things, yes. um, which is rather challenging for all of us, I think. Um, but uh, I, my question is really, what place you see for these kinds of individualized approaches to learning alongside classroom pedagogy and how far the two can be integrated or teachers sh now have to be thinking about how to promote or advise or um, support the, that style of learning alongside classroom learning. Um, thank you. It's, it's an important issue that, that I, I do actually talk about quite a lot, even in my, my book. Um, and one of the reasons is that I see that there's a, there's a relationship between the, the formal classroom environment and then the informal learning. Now, I mentioned before about sustained learning outside of the classroom will be very dependent upon having that skill and will. I mean, it's, it's motivation and uh, skills are what lead to students to be able to use tools outside of the classroom in informal learning situations. Now, if they're lacking the motivation, even if they have the skills, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, the only thing that we can do is try to encourage our learners to be able to understand the importance of language learning. I mean, whether it happens through technology or not through technology, I think we do see many students are still struggling with this, this vision of what language learning is in many contexts. But our formal learning, I think, should be the, the, the bridge, the gateway to what happens in our informal learning. And I see it myself as the term I've used is lifelong mobility. It's the training that we receive in our formal learning. We should be able to carry that with us in future. But what it means is that our training in formal context shouldn't only be focusing on what's only happening inside the classroom. And you're quite correct, I was fairly limited with what I could discuss here. But um, we need to be preparing our students with the skills to take above and beyond what happens just inside the classroom into the future, which is not just during the summer holidays or between this class and the next class, but hopefully leaving uh, the ability to choose new apps from what's available, available, the ability to maintain some motivation in learning over the longer period of time where they can engage in real language learning in maybe more authentic contexts. I think probably most of us would who have studied languages would know that, that what we learnt during our formal education was only a very small part of where we are with our language ability now. And as a result of that, I think we should be trying to see how technology, which is something we carry with us through our life in many cases, particularly with our, our mobile phones, that can often have the same apps, the same information carried across over long periods of time, how we can take advantage of that to have our lifelong mobility. I think I probably haven't answered your question very well, but um, I think that really there needs to be a bridge between the two. And just simply saying that, okay, we have these so we don't need uh, to have classes anymore, I would call that very dangerous, to be honest. I think that there needs to be sufficient ongoing face-to-face, -face, or if it's distance education, perhaps not, but human interaction for the training support during the formal learning process to enable learners to be able to engage in more informal learning. Okay, thank you. I think we have a question over here. Just to... And one at the back there too. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you very much for, for the insightful presentation. Um, 
I really appreciated the point about uh, demystifying and, and kind of taking away the hype. Um, and related to that, there's the argument of scale. Yes. Uh, we need lots of people to understand how to, how to use these technologies. Um, and with that, um, the, the idea of understanding the affordances of the technology. Mm -hmm. um, one question and, and concern that I have yes, yes. is around this opacity mm -hmm. of what we can understand, like the threshold mm -hmm. um, where we can tinker, put things in, see what comes out, so mm -hmm. more of a user experience yes, yes, yes. as opposed to having a deeper insight. Mm -hmm. So I was, and, and that requires a lot of expertise yes, because yes, yes. Uh, these models are very complex yes. and many of them are in a black box. Yes. So how, how do we move towards that? Or, or do you see a point where we'll have to kind of live with and understand this user experience um, and, and take these technologies as they are? You know, how much can we push and break the black box? Um, it's, it's a very good question. Uh, I think there's going to be, <clears throat> uh, to a certain degree, we need to understand the technology, but to a certain degree, I think we kind of exist in the black box in many ways anyway. If you look at our mobile phones, for example, we know what it can do, but we're not fully familiar with what goes on behind the scenes. But we do have, I think, a better understanding than we have at the moment with this, this generative AI. Um, I believe that we need to have uh, more uh, available information in, a, in a, a manageable format where people can say, well, what is this AI? And the, the term you use is demystifying. And I think that that's really what we need to be doing, that if we can actually have resources published, easily accessible by anyone, where we can see, well, what goes on behind this? I mean, it's, it's kind of there in obscure websites around, but this needs to be made more uh, publicly available to people for their specific uses. So, for example, for language teachers, maybe we need to have a resource which kind of breaks down the parts that we need to know. I mean, I don't think we need to know what the algorithms are that go behind that, but it's very, to me, it was enlightening to see how ChatGPT, for example, was trained by a machine and by humans. It kind of added a new element to understand that. And I think maybe th that's something that, that we need these, perhaps, repositories of information that, that show how it has been used. And, I mean, the only ones that can really create that are people who have the skills and the, the experience with that. And I think it's a, it's a responsibility, in one sense, for people in that community using the technologies to, to get this out more so. And actually, we discussed exactly the same point at Eurocore last week in Iceland. Yeah, so thank you. I think we have time for maybe two short questions. Um, I'm Satinda Shen from the University of Bethesda. Um, just a quick one. I think um, just a follow up on your point on assessment. Because I, yeah, so it's just um, really to the point that the, um, there's a lot of opportunity to move away from just looking at the product, but like really to create a space for us to focus on the process because that is huge for language testers. Like, how do we move away from the final product, but actually consider the process, how students actually produce the piece of work in yes. assessment? So, just like a follow up to that, yeah. Okay. Um, I think that this, there's going to be a lot more discussion from here on about how to do this, and this is really what we need to be having from here on in. Um, the technology is new. I mean, it's, AI is not new, but in its current form it is. And these are the open discussions, the dialogues, the constructive discussions that we need to be having about what it means for assessment practices. And I think we'll get there. But there's going to be a few maybe heated discussions for a while before we do. Okay, thank you. Last question. Would you still like a question? Maybe 
Maybe. Maybe what we'll do. So we do have one question um, on on the chat. Okay. Yep. Um, it, it, it's more a, a question, kind of seeking advice okay. about using Chat GPT. So okay. maybe just some of your reflections on the the regulations you're currently working within your institution and, and thoughts about okay. that. Um, I think probably most of us are experiencing the same thing that universities and, and other institutions are still struggling to find out what to do with guidelines. Um, we're finding that in many cases that the, the institutions are leaving it up to the teacher to make the decisions. And while I appreciate the sentiment, at the same time it causes enormous confusion for the learners when they're allowed to use it in this class and not allowed to use it in this class and totally unsure what to do in this class. So we're going to need to be having this, again I'm using the word dialogue, a lot but not only at the administration level, it needs to be between the teachers and I believe the teachers need to be having the dialogue with their students first of all so they can make some informed decisions to bring it up to that level where policies are being formed. So the question, I guess it's the answer to the question is that um, first of all let the students see the strengths and the weaknesses of the technology. Let the teachers see the strengths and the weaknesses of the technology and only when they've really got to that point do I think that they can make intelligent decisions about uh, what the guidelines will be. I see a little bit too much of a rush to use either too open or too restrictive guidelines without really understanding what it is. Yeah. Absolutely, we, we certainly need to, to know more about these things. Thank you for the questions. Thank you, Thank you for your responses. Um,